Hello, everyone. Welcome. Do we still need some more chairs? We have quite a nice crowd. Thank you. Welcome to the fall of 2024 lecture series. We're very excited about the programs and happy that you are too. One brief announcement, I just want to remind you because we have some new faces. We're going to hold your questions if you would. We'll have a nice question and answer period. And at that time we have microphones, so we'd ask you to raise your hand if you have a question so we can get the microphone to you so everybody can hear. And of course, the Zoom people, a reminder that you can enter into Q&A, type in your questions anytime starting now, and then we will read those questions for you when it comes to Q&A. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about our speaker. We're very excited. Rod Smala is president of the Vermont Law and Graduate School. He's an educator, writer, legal scholar, teacher, and courtroom litigator. He's been on the faculty of many American universities and a university leader, including posts at president of Furman University, dean of three law schools, the University of Richmond, Washington and Lee University, and the Delaware Law Schools, and now president of Vermont Law and Graduate School. He's the author of over 17 books and 80 law review articles. He's also a nationally known constitutional law litigator who has argued cases in state and federal courts throughout the United States including the U.S. Supreme Court. He was the principal lawyer arguing First Amendment issues on behalf of Dominion Voting Company in its historic suit against Fox News arising from false claims that the election was stolen from Donald Trump, resulting in a $786 million settlement in favor of Dominion. He is one of the nation's leaders, leading scholars on the U.S. Constitution and the U.S. Supreme Court. And before I introduce him, I want to let you know that he did leave some books in the back. If anyone is interested after the lecture, it's $25. <laughs> Cindy's showing the books. It's, <laughs> it's $25, and it tells right there. It's either cash or it tells you how to make out your checks, not, dire not directly to you, I guess. Okay, please give a very war warm welcome to Rod Smola. <laughs> Well, thanks, and uh, I appreciate you all coming out today. I want to begin by just relating a story to you about a, a very famous historical debate. And the debate was over this question. What is the world's oldest profession? Now, some of you are snickering. I <laughs> Keep those evil thoughts to yourself. And the debate was between three professionals, a doctor who claimed medicine, surgery was the oldest profession, an engineer who claimed engineering was the world's oldest profession, and a lawyer who said the law was the world's oldest profession. Now I know again some of you have heard there's another profession that's the oldest, but this will set you straight. So the doctor went first, and he said, to be sure, medicine, surgery, is the world's oldest profession. And my proof is from the book of Genesis, because it says that God reached in to Adam's rib, extracted the rib, and created Eve. Therefore, surgery, medicine, is the world's oldest profession. The engineer replied, ha, 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 I gotcha. Engineering is the world's oldest profession. And I will cite as my proof your same source, the book of Genesis. Because it says that out of the chaos, God created the heavens and the earth. Out of chaos came order. That is engineering. Engineering is the world's oldest profession. At which point the lawyer made one of those moves that I often use in the courtroom. This is what I call the satisfied cluck maneuver, all right? <laughs> they, I gotcha. The lawyer says, ha, 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 I rest my case. Yeah, I rest my case. Surgery, chaos, order. Who do you think made the chaos? <laughs> <laughs> Who 
So you may think lawyers are fomenters of chaos. You may think our constitutional history has been chaotic. You may think the Supreme Court is a chaotic institution. I'm here to set you straight. I'm going to bring order to that chaos in 45 minutes or less. I'm going to teach you the entire history of the United States Constitution. Now, you may think, you may think, ah, that can't be. You might be able to tell, particularly those of you in the front rows here, that I'm wearing a bow tie that has the United States Constitution printed on it. So go figure, if the Constitution will fit on a bow tie, surely you ought to be able to describe it in 45 minutes. So I divide the history of our constitutional experience into four epochs, four periods. And I'm going to describe each one for you, including the new one that we have just entered in the last three or four years. The first is what I call the founding epoch. And this is typically associated with one of the most important and famous figures in American history. Chief Justice John Marshall. He's not as well known as George Washington and Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, but you can make the argument that of the, in the founding period, he has had as much influence on the history of this country as anyone that has ever lived. He and another Supreme Court justice who came from New England named Joseph Story were responsible for shaping so much of our constitutional history. I'll tell you a story about Story at the very end. So what were the characteristics of the Supreme Court in this early period, the first 30 or 40 years of the Republic? Here was how the Supreme Court approached the Constitution. First, it was very non-literal, very non-textual. John Marshall did not feel bound by the words of the Constitution. Most importantly, he was quite willing, and the other justices were quite willing, to read things into it that weren't there. Big things, giant things, huge constitutional principles that weren't anchored clearly in any part of the text. Secondly, in that founding epoch, the Supreme Court strongly favored the national government over the states. So in this never-ending American struggle between central power at the federal level and diffused power at the state level, that court put its thumb on central power. Third, the court made it clear that if state law conflicts with federal law, if state law conflicts with the Constitution of the United States, the state law would have to give way. The Constitution was supreme. Fourthly, arguably most importantly, the Marshall Court, the founding court, announced the stunning proposition that a court could override the Congress and the President, could override democracy, could declare a law passed by Congress, signed by the President, unconstitutional, and therefore null and void. The famous ruling in the case Marbury versus Madison. Remember I told you the court did not feel bound by the text? That principle, that the Supreme Court can overrule laws, doesn't appear anywhere in the Constitution. It has been one of the most defining characteristics of our nation, and it's not in there. They made it up. John Marshall, in that famous opinion, reasoned from principle, from history, from philosophy. But isn't it fascinating that the constitutional text, which has a very detailed list of the things Congress can do and not do, has a modestly detailed list of the things that the president is supposed to do, creates the Supreme Court. The Constitution creates the Supreme Court and doesn't say nothing about what the Supreme Court's job is, including this awesome power to overrule the other two branches. 
fascinating. What were other characteristics? The Supreme Court in those early 30 years said, we are a national economic marketplace. There's not a Georgia economy. There's not a Virginia economy. There's not a New York economy. There's not a New England. We are one common market, like the European Union would be today. And any state barriers to free trade, to free movement of people, et cetera, setting aside slavery, which we'll get to, is unconstitutional. What about civil rights and civil liberties? You and I today, when we think of the Supreme Court, we think so much about things like freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and race discrimination, and so on. Zero. Not a peep. Not a word. Not one decision on freedom of speech. Not one decision on religion. Not one decision on anything you and I would think of as civil rights and civil liberties. Among the reasons, those liberties are mainly listed in the Bill of Rights. You know, the Bill of Rights, First Amendment, Second Amendment, and so on. Well, before the Civil War, the Bill of Rights was treated as only binding the federal government. It didn't apply to the states. So the First Amendment prohibits the establishment of religion. The idea is there would be no Church of England here. There would be no Church of the United States, a national established religion. But states were free to have established it, and eight of them did. A number of different religious traditions were established by various states. The last established religion wasn't abolished until shortly before the Civil War, because the Bill of Rights just didn't apply. It wasn't, it wasn't incorporated against the states. The one exception involving what you and I might think of as civil rights and civil liberties were a series of profound decisions written by John Marshall affecting First Nations, indigenous peoples. And there was very little in the substance of the Constitution that tells us the relationship between the government and the Indian. They're mentioned a number of times, but in a series of famous decisions, the Supreme Court said the Indians have no title land. Uh, they were conquered as a conquered people. They are subject to the will of the conqueror. And although John Marshall himself said, in the eyes of God, in the conscience of mankind, in the judgment of history, we have wronged the Indians, I don't have the power to help them. Because I am subordinate to the government that created me, and that government is the conqueror, and I can't help you. Go to the president, go to Congress, the court can be of no use. In many ways tragic, in many ways setting 200 years of displacement in the way that we have treated indigenous peoples. That's the first epoch. We're almost, all, and we're one-fourth of the way through the whole lecture. <laughs> but those were the characteristics, and they still have a huge influence on American history. The next epoch, the second, is a giant. It's a giant in terms of its time frame. This stretches from before the Civil War, 1850-ish sort of time period, to 1937. You're going to say, what the heck, 1937? That's a weird year to just pick out of nowhere, but I'll explain that in a few minutes. But 100 years, basically, 100 years of time. What were the characteristics of the Supreme Court during this time period? First, in a reversal of the founding period, the court during this epoch took a very limited view of federal power, of national power. It flipped. It empowered the states and, and emaciated the powers of the federal government. Among other things, this led to one of the precipitating factors that led to the Civil War. Over this 100-year period, the court was very, very, very skeptical of the powers of Congress to pass law. There's a couple, to us now today, shocking examples. The court in this period struck down all federal antitrust laws. So the Sherman Antitrust Act was declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. Congress didn't have the power to regulate 
antitrust arrangements because that was for the states to do if they chose to do it. The states to decide whether monopolies were good or monopolies were bad. Congress didn't have the power to enact child labor legislation. A federal law regulating child labor was held to be beyond the powers of Congress. Whether children should go to work in factories or not is a state problem. It's not a federal problem beyond the powers of Congress. This court took a devastating of equality. Early, early decision of this court, Dred Scott versus Sanford, said that in the nature of things, in, in, in the nature of, of, of the universe, basically, blacks were deemed to be an inferior people. They could never be citizens of the United States. Dred Scott, the slave who claimed to have been emancipated because he went from a slave state to a free state, could not bring a suit in federal court for his emancipation because suits are limited to citizens and a person of African descent not be a citizen. That was the decision that really precipitated Abraham Lincoln's entry into national politics, his famous debates with Stephen Douglas, his election to be the President of the United States. I told you that the Marshall Court had said federal law is supreme over state law, but that festered. That may have been what the court said, but it festered, and it particularly festered in the South, where the great fear was that federal law would come to abolish slavery. And so that began this notion that states could decide for themselves their own view of the Constitution. They weren't bound by the Supreme Court's decisions. They didn't like them. They weren't bound by Act of Congress or the, or the acts of the President. They didn't like them. In fact, if they wanted to, they could quit, succeed from the Union. Very powerful, powerful, powerful counter to that founding era. This was a epoch in which, in addition to slavery, the court was incredibly hostile. Equal protection. Notwithstanding the bloody Civil War, the, the, the worst war in American history, 750,000 people killed and hundreds of thousands more wounded and, and the entire nation disrupted. In the aftermath of that were the Civil War Amendments, 13th Amendment abolishing slavery, 14th Amendment guaranteeing equal protection, 15th Amendment prohibiting discrimination in voting. But the Supreme Court completely eviscerated those amendments. It held in Plessy versus Ferguson that forcing people to be in different places based on the color of their skin was permissible, separate but equal. Separate but equal train cars, separate but equal toilets, separate but equal swimming pools, separate but equal schools. Saying it's not a badge of inferiority against black people. White people don't want to be with black people. Black people don't want to be with white people. And these amendments were not designed to create social interaction. And as long as you have the right to vote or the right to serve on a jury, you can't complain that law forces you to a different train car or to a different bathroom. So no friend of what we now think of as enlightened policy on race discrimination. Aside from race, forget about it. Zero protection for the rights of women. When Susan B. Anthony and others tried to use the Equal Protection Clause to argue they had a right to vote, the Supreme Court rebuffed it. From my own home state of Illinois, a woman sought admission to the Illinois Bar. This was before law schools existed in the way that we now think of law schools. People would read for the bar. It was sort of an apprenticeship. And if you proved that you knew the craft of being a lawyer, you could be admitted. Abraham Lincoln was admitted to the Illinois Bar through this process. The person who was widely acknowledged in the state of Illinois to be the most learned expert on Illinois law and practice was a woman named Myra Bradwell. She petitioned for admission, and the Supreme Court of Illinois said, you're undoubtedly probably the most qualified person in the state of Illinois, but we don't let women it's a man's profession. That went to the United States Supreme Court, a case called Bradwell versus Illinois. And the court sided with Illinois 
and against Myra Bradwell. And the opinion recited, the place of woman, the law of the Constitution, and the law of the Creator. The court had the who hubris to is that woman's place is as a mother and a wife, and not as a professional. Well, if blacks got no rights and women got no rights, you might as well forget about anybody else. The idea that there would be protection for what we now describe as LGBTQ plus status, unthinkable, unthinkable. There was also no protection in any meaningful sense of other civil liberties. Not a single case protecting freedom of speech, not one. In every case in which free speech issues reached the Supreme Court of the United States, the government won and the speaker lost, including very dramatic cases during World War I, where there was a tremendous amount of ferment against World War I. The Supreme Court of the United States affirmed sending to the penitentiary protester after protester. Some anonymous people that you've never heard of, people dropping leaflets in New York City against, uh, against the war. Others, famous people. Eugene Debs, one of the famous labor leaders in American history, ran for president four times. His life was ruined. He was sent to the penitentiary for 10 years for a speech he gave critical of World War I and the draft. So no protection for freedom of speech. No protection for anything connected to religion. No meaningful decisions forcing the Establishment Clause, no meaningful decisions of forcing the free exercise of religion clause, nothing. No protection for the criminally accused. All of the things we grew up with, all of the things you see on TV, Miranda warnings and all that stuff, zero. No restraint on police against the criminally accused. No right to an attorney in a, in a, in a, in a case. No restrictions of any kind on the death penalty. What about structure out of this Supreme Court Act? Well, two things. I said no protection for civil liberties, but there's one giant footnote to that. One liberty that got huge protection. I call it entrepreneurial liberty. Protection for business, protection for capital, protection for the free enterprise system. The court treated free markets and freedom from government regulation of business as a sacred constitutional right. And any attempt at the state level or the federal level to interfere with the marketplace, to regulate the market in some way, particularly the labor market, was deemed to violate the Constitution violate the constitutional right of liberty, which the court interpreted as essentially incorporating Adam Smith laissez-faire free market economics. So I'll give you some examples. I already told you about child labor laws. That was an interference with the freedom of the employer to employ a child. Minimum wage laws, unconstitutional. Maximum hours legislation, unconstitutional. Any labor law, any law that was a labor law, the court said, if that's all it is, it violates the freedom of the employer and the employee to freely contract. No protection for unions. Nothing that interfered with business was permitted. And among other things, this made the court very hostile to administrative agency, just beginning to come into existence after the Depression very hostile to anything that was seen as interference with the market. This included, and now I'm going to come to the end of the epoch, this included the court strongly enforcing something that's going to sound real fancy and technical, but actually it's not, too, it's not going to be hard. The, a thing called the non-delegation doctrine. That's the fancy name. And here's what it means. The Supreme Court said only Congress can make laws. That's the, you know, we all learned this in the fourth grade. Legislature makes the laws, executive enforces the laws, judiciary interprets the laws. Only Congress can make the laws. That means what Congress can't do is create an administrative agency 
and say to the agency, you create rules governing your area. You create rules governing banks. You create rules governing the environment. You create rules governing agriculture. You create rules governing the new age of radio and television. The Supreme Court said, you can't do that. You got to create the rules. You can put the agency in charge of policing them, but you can't give the agency the power to make law. That's delegating your legislative authority. So how did this epoch end, and why would I give it such a crazy notion that I can tell you the day it ended, like 1937, right? <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you about the transition, and then I'm going to give you the characteristics of the third epoch. The transition is remarkably similar to where we are in society right now at this moment, and the, some of the debates you'll hear between Vice President Harris and former President Trump. And the Supreme Court was at the center of it. Remember your history. Stock market crashed. Herbert Hoover was voted out of office. Franklin Roosevelt was voted president of the United States. He came in, and the country was in deep depression. My parents were children of the Depression. My dad would fight in World War II. My mom was a Rosie the Riveter. They lived in Nebraska. They saw the Dust Bowl, the poverty. The whole country experienced. And Franklin Roosevelt's theory, the New Deal theory, was we got to have action. We got to have federal action. We got to create agencies. We got to create programs. He's famous for the first 100 days of his administration. It was, and they, they created the alphabet programs, or all these things, the WPA, the FCC, you name it. They all had, you know, they all had letters. And the idea was we got to figure out a way to deal with the Dust Bowl. We've got to figure out a way to deal with the Depression. We've got to figure out a way to deal with unemployment. We've got to figure out a way to deal with all the things plaguing the nation. And the national government has got to be the one that does it. And he had a Democratic Congress, a Democratic Senate, and a Democratic House of Representatives. So you could move the legislation along. So the law would get passed by both houses. It would get signed by President Roosevelt. And somebody would challenge it, the Supreme Court of the United States. And in decision after decision after decision, the Supreme Court struck down the New Deal program. You can't do this, you can't do that. You can't do this, you can't do that. Why? Because that was still that second epoch. You can't interfere with business. You can't regulate farming. You can't, you can't, these are state, this is a state's problem. Let Nebraska deal with the Dust Bowl. Not the federal government's job. Another thing that the Supreme Court was hostile to was that one of the ways the New Deal dealt with this was the creation of these agencies. And the agencies would pass regulations as part of how they regulated the economy. So an agency was created to regulate the supply of oil and energy in the United States. The Supreme Court struck it down. That, that violates the non-delegation doctrine. You can regulate the price of oil, Congress, but you can't give that to an agency. And then the climactic case called the Schechter Poultry case. In, when I went to law school, we knew it as the sick chicken case. Congress, of course, created the Department of Agriculture and gave to the Department of Agriculture vast powers to regulate farming. How much corn the farmer could plant, um, how, how many chickens you could have, what the, safety, what the safety regulations should be at a poultry factory, but even more, how much you had to pay the workers, setting minimum wages if you were going to work in a, in, a, in a chicken processing factory. The Supreme Court struck that down in 1936 under the non-delegation doctrine. Franklin Roosevelt had had enough was apoplectic. He started railing against the Supreme Court. <coughs> he would give his radio talks. My mom described those radio talks to me. Some of you probably learned them when you were young children. And he would say, the Supreme Court are these nine old men. Nobody elected them. They're interfering with the progress of the country. And he proposed what became known as the court packing plan. 
forever we'd had nine Supreme Court justices. Now this is actually a constitutional oversight. So the framers did a lot of good jobs. They messed this up. Because they tell you there's one president, there's one vice president. This is the formula for the House of Representatives. Every state's got two senators. They don't put in the Constitution how many Supreme Court justices there. Every state has it. Vermont says five, you know. They didn't put that number in. To me, it's like, I'm going to invent the game of basketball, and here's the deal. You just put however many players you feel is right out there, all right? <laughs> it's an oversight. So historically, Congress has been in charge of how many justices there are. Wasn't always nine. There were times when it was six. There was times when it was seven. High point, at one point it was 10. But it had been nine for about 100 years. It had been nine since before the Civil War. Franklin Roosevelt said, just pass a new law. Let's up it to 15. Let's add six more justices. I keep losing these cases, like by five to four, all right? You give me five new picks, <laughs> I'm going to start winning cases. So what we'll do is for every justice that reaches the age of 70, we'll add a Supreme Court justice up to a max of 15. He was shocked that the country hated the idea. Not only did Republicans balk, Democrats balked. They saw it as tinkering with the system. They saw it as a kind of cheating. You know, they said, you can't do that. The fact that it was called the court packing scheme shows you how history looked at it. It's interesting, we're now talking about that same thing again. Very interesting. We'll talk to you about that later. In any event, all of a sudden, some justices retired. One of the justices switched sides. Justice Roberts, it's called the switch in time that saved nine. Cute, right? And starting in the year 1937, the Supreme Court began the third epoch. And when I teach constitutional law to students, I use my hands and I say, in the second epoch, everything looked like this. Protection for business, no civil liberties. In the third epoch, everything looks like this. No protection for business, explosion of protection for civil liberty. So what were, the, ep what, what, what were the, the characteristics of this? Now it began in 1937 because that's when the Supreme Court began to uphold federal programs. But the deeper, more soulful, more profound pieces of it would come in ensuing years. And I'll run through them very quickly. What were the characteristics? First, the court got out of the business of protecting business. It said, how much you regulate or don't regulate the free market economy is not a judicial decision. That is a, that is a political call. What, what level you set taxes at, whether you have minimum wages, whether you have maximum hours legislation, whether you have consumer protection legislation, anything connected to interference with the free market in business is a Matter for Congress, at the state level for the states, we're not going to get into that anymore. A giant profound difference. The court paved the way for enormous power for administrative agencies. It essentially overruled the sick chicken case and said, Congress doesn't have to set the specific rules. All Congress has to do is give the agency a guiding push, a guiding principle. And it can be very general. It can be like, protect the environment. It can be like, my favorite, regulate broadcast television and radio in the public interest. <laughs> it can be like the directions to the Federal Reserve Board. Oh, very, very general. The idea, leave it to the experts, leave it to the administrative agencies. You can do that, Congress. Um, it took a very narrow view of states' rights, which it needed to do to put down the resistance to Brown versus Board of Education and the overruling of Plessy versus Brown. There was an explosion of equality protection. Suddenly, robust protection for people of color, beginning with the very famous decision in Brown v. Board of Education, overruling separate but equal, and integrating American schools, which then got expanded even to affirmative action, even to saying the government could use race-conscious means 
to promote greater diversity, particularly in American universities. A complete flip of what had happened before. Women went from complete strangers to the Constitution to a group very strongly protected in our constitutional law, led most famously by the advocacy as a lawyer of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and then by her opinions as Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, where in one of her most famous opinions, she struck down the male-only rule at the Virginia Military Institute, saying that VMI must admit men and women both, and you can't count on old Southern issue, notions of chivalry and so on to keep it exclusively male. A going back to a loose interpretation of the constitutional text, not fe feeling bound by the words to decide the principles in the text, including the rights in the text. And this was most famously the basis for the court's expansive view of protection relating to sex, sexuality, sexual identity, gender identity. It began in a case called Griswold versus Connecticut. Connecticut, a heavily Catholic church, made it a crime to use contraception, unless contraception was medically required to protect the health of the mother. So a married couple that wanted to have sex with each other but not have children could not get birth control, could not get a condom, could not get any kind of contraception because this was contrary to traditional Roman Catholic theology. Catholics had to use the rhythm system. It was challenged, it was challenged, and the Supreme Court struck down the Connecticut law. But it was a tricky thing to do because the word sex is not in the Constitution. Nothing about procreation is in the Constitution. Nothing about contraception is in the Constitution. The court had to say, we think that humans have a right of privacy. You'd think the Constitution would say that. It actually doesn't anywhere. <laughs> Even the idea of a right of privacy is not in the text. But the court said, it's implied. It's implied in human dignity. It's in the interstices of all the other rights that we recognize. And the idea that the government can tell you whether or not you want to have children or not, the government can tell you whether or not within a marriage you can use birth control or not, violates that implied right of privacy. This, of course, then led to abortion protection and Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade came right out of that notion of an implied right of privacy. And then it led, ultimately, after years of struggle, to protection for LGBTQ uh, 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 community folks, and ultimately to same-sex marriage. The Supreme Court in the Obergefell decision at the very end of this third epoch saying people have a constitutional right to marry whomever they want without regard to whether that person is the same gender as you. It was a period of huge explosion for other forms of civil liberty, freedom of speech, Right to burn the American flag, right to engage in racist speech, right to um, do all sorts of things that are highly offensive to most people of mainstream sensibilities because free speech doesn't allow you to censor things just because you don't like it. Very strong protection for religious liberty. Finally, um, a willingness for all sorts of reasons to empower federal administrative agents. And so federal administrative agencies were on a tremendous roll in terms of their power. You might like what they did, not like what they did. But courts did not mess with them. And courts almost always said, we realize the act of Congress that created you doesn't actually say you can do this, but that's OK. Because it's sort of within your, it's within your portfolio. So the demise of the non-delegation doctrine. Almost done. The fourth epoch. When did the fourth epoch start? I'm going to say 2019-ish. The thing about an epoch, it's like the dinosaur epoch. It's not like the, all the triceratops like, disappear in one day. It takes a while for, it to, it takes a while for the epoch to, to, to work its way in. But it has. And it's here right now. So what are the characteristics of this epoch? Well, first, a complete flip 
from the third epoch, a going back to the primacy of the written text, basically of the notion that if you're coming to us saying there's some constitutional right or principle here, you better be able to show us where it's written down in the constitutional text or something close to it. You've got to anchor it in that. Connected to that, a strong emphasis on the original intent of the framers. Whoever wrote that text, whatever they would have done to answer this question, binds us. So this was the principal theme in the Dobbs case, overruling Roe v. Wade, because the Supreme Court said, you can't possibly tell us that those who enacted the 14th Amendment intended to protect abortion rights. Of course they did. And since that wasn't what they had in mind when they passed the 14th Amendment, it's not in the Constitution. Also has been a powerful theme in Second Amendment jurisprudence, in the right to keep and bear arms. The Supreme Court has said, when, when a city, when a state, when a federal agency wants to regulate guns in some way, we will only allow it if you can show us that at the time of the creation of the Second Amendment, the government back then would have considered this sort of regulation okay. Sometimes that results in striking down the laws, sometimes it results in upholding the laws, but it's generally a pro-gun owner approach. Um, a complete reversal of affirmative action. In a landmark ruling two years ago, the Supreme Court saying the idea that you can use race consciousness, for example, to enhance the diversity at the University of Vermont, violates the Equal Protection Clause, no longer permitted. Famous case decided two years ago involving Harvard and the University of North Carolina. A complete redoing of the religion clauses. Whereas in the third epoch, the court had taken separation of church and state somewhat seriously. It wasn't extreme, but it was fairly robust. This court seems to believe that that's not really an important constitutional and has strongly retreated from the ideas that government must be separate and distinct from religion. Uh, finally, and I'll be more or less done with where we are in this epoch, a very strong movement on something that may seem boring and technical to you, but has a huge impact on our country. And that is a reversal of the empowering of administrative agents, replaced by a, an ongoing march to undo what some people would call the administrative state, to question whether certain agencies are either even legal, are they even, do they even legally exist, and very strongly curtailing the power of Congress to delegate to agents powers to pass regulation. I'll tell you a very quick story about that. I have to be very quick. Here's where I first saw that coming. In a very obscure case called Gundy versus the United States. Here's the fact pattern. You will remember at the turn of the last century, all across the country, we became very concerned about sexual offenders and, and, and registries for sexual offenders. And that became suddenly a new point of emphasis because of all the child abuse we'd seen and the domestic violence and sexual offense. And Congress passed a law, very similar to what many states have as well, requiring that if you were convicted of a sexual offense, when you got out of prison, you had to be part of, this, of the sexual offender registry system. You had to report for duty, you had to tell people where you lived. It became a way to try to keep people from repeating the sexual offense. Nobody doubts that Congress could pass that law for federal crimes. Nobody doubts it. But what about the folks that were in jail in federal penitentiaries, convicted of sexual offenses before the law was passed? So Mr. Gundy was convicted of a sexual offense. He was serving like a 10-year sentence. In his seventh or eighth year of his sentence, Congress passes this offender law. 
so Gundy says, well, I don't have to register because when I committed the crime, the law didn't exist. You can't retroactively create a crime. That's called an ex post facto law. Or at least, at least, if you were going to do something like that, it should take an act of Congress. Well, what did Congress do? Did it make the, the, the people in the pipeline subject or not to, to it or not? Congress punted. Congress punted. Congress said to the Attorney General, we don't know whether to make it retroactive or not. You decide. You decide whether the people currently in jail will have to register or not. Whatever you decide, that'll be the rule. Well, Mr. Gundy took that to the Supreme Court of the United States and argued that this violated the non-delegation doctrine. He lost. In an opinion by Justice Elena Kagan, one of the liberals on the court, she said, non-delegation, non-delegation. We haven't overruled a delegation, a case like this since the sick chicken case. She didn't say sick chicken. Since the Schechter poultry case. But it was kind of mocking of, of the idea of the delegation doctrine. And she won. It was an interesting win, though, because Justice Scalia had passed away. So there were only eight justices. Four justices, led by Justice Kagan, said, this is no problem. We don't care about delegation to administrative agents. Three justices, three conservative justices, led by the newly appointed Justice Gorsuch, said, mm, you know, we think the Schechter Poultry case was one of the greatest cases ever decided by the Supreme Court. We think the non-delegation doctrine is the right thing. That should be the rule. And we think we should bring it back. Justice Samuel Alito said, I kind of agree. I kind of agree with my three conservative colleagues. But if I vote with them, it's going to be a 4-4 tie. So you know, in baseball, tie goes to the runner. In the Supreme Court, tie means no opinion. And whatever the lower court said, sticks. And the lower court here had upheld the delegation. And Justice Alito said, you know what? Down the road, if this comes to me again, and there's five votes to reinstate the non-delegation doctrine, I'd be game to go there. But I don't want to do that in this case. So even though I kind of agree with the conservatives, I'm going to vote with the liberals, just so there's not chaos in the federal prison system. But down the road, we'll see what happens. And it turns out that what has happened is the non-delegation doctrine, under slightly different terminology, has come back roaring. And this Supreme Court, in a whole series of decisions in the last two or three years, has struck down decisions of administrative agencies that are not clearly grounded in the statute passed by Congress. So some examples. Very famous environmental case, West Virginia versus Environmental Protection Agency. The EPA was in the process of considering rules that would force much more, much more energy production to clean production, away from carbon fuels. The Supreme Court said, that's a huge, giant decision. Only Congress can do that. Environmental Protection Agency, you can't. When President Biden attempted to cancel student debt and claimed that the statute allowed him to cancel student debt, the Supreme Court said, no, no, no. You can't just on your own cancel $430 billion of student debt. Only Congress can do that. That violates the non-delegation doctrine. When OSHA tried during the height of the pandemic to force workers to either wear masks or get tested, the Supreme Court struck that down. Said, OSHA, you're there for protection of worker safety. It's not your job to decide health policy. Congress didn't say you have to have masks. Congress didn't say um, you have to get tested. Only Congress can make that decision. I could give you other examples. So you see now the extraordinary movement in the history of our Supreme Court and where we are in the fourth epoch. What I'd like to do is take your questions, and then at the very end, I'll do what I promised I would do, tell you the Joseph story, story which you'll love on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> so the floor is open. Thanks. Uh, that was great, thank you. Um, 
You said freedom of speech does not allow you to censor speech just because you don't like it. So do you disagree with the Democrats who are now saying they want to censor hate speech? Yeah. So um, this is very controversial. This is probably the biggest divide in our family. My wife was here. Anya, wave your hand if people can see you. <laughs> we have five children. And, and in, in, the, in, the, in the Smola family Supreme Court, I'm a dissenter. Uh, because uh, our, our progressive children do think you should be able to censor hate speech. It's a very, very fair and difficult point. For most of our history, that was permitted. That is to say, rules prohibiting hate speech were upheld by the Supreme Court. Um, but in this modern epoch, the court di I, I gave it a loose phrase. The court basically said the fact that the, that the society finds speech offensive, repugnant, contrary to our values, is never enough standing alone to justify its abridgment. I'm old school on that view. I believe in that. And I have, as a free speech lawyer, my book there, Confessions of a Free Speech Lawyer, most of the big First Amendment cases that I've been involved in, or many of them, I hated the speech. I, I didn't like the person. I didn't like what was being said. But I thought the person, the organization, had a right to do it. So I do, but I understand it's a very fair argument on both sides. Uh, if, you'll if you'll let me give you one little bit more addition to the answer. It's simplistic to say that the idea that even offensive speech is protected under the Constitution is the new governing rule. In fact, that rule and an opposite rule, which is that society can regulate speech that offends our sense of morality or our sense of order, both exist. They both exist. But there's how it's done. In the open marketplace, streets, sidewalks, the streets of Charlottesville, Virginia, that's what my book is about, the Unite the Right rally, the internet, basically. Um, that is the rule. You can't censor speech because you disagree with it. But then we have these other settings in society in which we are trying to function and conduct business, like employment. So the very hateful speech that you have a right to say in the park on the Boston Common, don't think you have a right to say it when you go to work somewhere in Boston, because you can violate civil rights laws for that same offensive remark. You may have a right as a professor to make racist or homophobic statements if you want, in, 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 in books you write, in, 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 in speeches you make um, at, uh, you know, at a rally, but don't try that in a classroom. The university can say, we respect human dignity, we respect community, we respect order and morality here. So the hate speech debate has been very intense on American campuses, where I think a university does have the right to say, coach, you're fired for that. Or student, you can't say that about another student in the dorm or in a classroom. Or professor. We don't allow that in the classroom. But if that person decides to march in a rally and take an offensive position down the street, my view is the university's got to lay off. Can't do anything. In the back. Or, or up. How do you reconcile an originalist court with uh, presidential immunity? Yeah, that's a great Im question. Particularly that. So the question, so everybody can hear it, is if, if it's an originalist court, how do you create something like presidential immunity, which is not, not in the text of the Constitution? Um, and so I'll give you several answers. First, my little fancy 45 minute lecture is about as neat as my poorly tied bow tie. All right? It's not perfect. And, every, and the things I described are not absolutely linear. And, of course, there are pockets of, of inferring things in every epoch. And there's, and there's originalism and a departure from originalism in every epoch. If I were Chief Justice Roberts, who wrote that opinion, answering your question, I think here's what he would say. I'm confident this is what he would say. He would say, actually, my opinion is originalism. Actually, what we did was look at what we thought the framers had in mind in the creation of the presidency. Bear in mind that Article II, 
which is where the presidential powers are described, it fits just on the back part of my knot here. It's only four, three or four or five paragraphs. It's very short and very, very general. And the Chief Justice Roberts would say, from the beginning, the Supreme Court has, has surrounded the presidency with protection. In the trial of Aaron Burr, which is back in the founding epoch, Aaron Burr wanted to subpoena documents in the White House from Thomas Jefferson, very much like the U.S. v. Nixon case. And John Marshall presided. Back in those days, the Supreme Court justices didn't have enough to do, so they, they had the moonlight, and they would sometimes be trial judges. He presided over this very famous trial in Richmond, Virginia. And he wrote that Thomas Jefferson is subject to process of the court, but can interpose the idea that certain documents he should be able to keep confidential. And the court would look at the documents and decide. And then this became the precedent for United States versus Nixon, where the court said President Nixon has executive privilege. That's not in the Constitution. It's not in our, but it's in the structure that, that, that people intended. And some documents might have to be turned over and some not. Later in the Nixon years, the Supreme Court created civil immunity for presidents. And so the lead up to this, this controversial decision ha had already established two clear things. One, that in civil liability, being sued for damages, a president has absolute immunity for things that fall within the president's duties and are within the outer perimeter of the president's duties. That was the that's a case called Nixon versus Fitzgerald. The Supreme Court then also made clear if the act of the president is not an official presidential act, there is zero immunity. That was a case called Clinton versus Jones. That was the Monica Lewinsky, Clinton, uh, you know, Paula Jones scandal. There's no way that Bill Clinton is immune for allegedly having sexually harassed Paula Jones at the Excelsior Hotel in Little Rock when he was governor of Arkansas. He can't claim that was a presidential act. So there's no immunity. The Supreme Court would later affirm that in a case, civil case involving President Trump. Okay? The, what the court had never been asked to decide was, is it going to be essentially the same framework on the criminal side? And I know that the media publication about that decision often gave you the sense that the court said the president has absolute immunity. That's not the ruling. The ruling is more nuanced. And you know, yesterday in front of Judge Chunkin in the uh, District of Columbia, the lawyers for both sides were arguing in front of her what the Supreme Court's decision means and what it doesn't mean. Her interpretation, she hasn't ruled yet, but what I could get from listening to the argument is what I think it means. So there's really three tiers. If it's an official act of the president, and it falls within the core, core, exclusive powers of the president, then there is absolute immunity. And the court gave some examples. The pardon power, the power to recognize foreign governments, the power to order your subordinates to do things. So that's why all of the things that Mr. Trump did to pressure the Justice Department are now out. Because of this idea, the core of your power has got to be you're the boss over the Justice Department. Then the court said, at the other extreme, anything that's private falls within the Bill Clinton rule. So you can make a very good argument that President Trump's call to Secretary Rathenberger in Georgia, trying to get to Georgia to change the number of votes, had nothing to do with any presidential duty, was a private act by Mr. Trump on his own behalf to try to save his presidency, and gets zero immunity. Decent argument there. I don't know if it, that's what will come out, but a very decent argument. Certainly all of Mr. Trump's other troubles, um, the libel suits and all that sort of business, private, no problem. But then there's this fascinating middle area. And this middle area is the area in which there's no question the act is official, but it may be non-core official. You know how when you go to the gym, like they tell you to work on your core? You know, it's like, Constitution's got, so, 
So what would an example be? Well, the president does a lot of things all the time as president, but he or she is not exercising the exclusive powers of the presidency. They're still trying to govern. What would be the easiest example? President calls the Speaker of the House. President calls you know, the, the, the majority leader in the Senate and says, come on, give me the votes for this bill. Come on, you pass it this way, I'll sign it. That's not within the core, but it's surely an official act. And the Supreme Court said, there, we're not saying there's absolute immunity. We're calling it presumptive immunity, which means it might be overcome. You might be able to overcome it. And I apologize for the long answer, but the most interesting place of this issue right now involves the conversations between President Trump and Vice President Pence, in which he tried to convince Vice President Pence to act in an unconstitutional way uh, by not certifying the electoral votes. I have a personal connection to that that I'm very proud of because one of my, one of my um, conservative legal friends uh, recruited a famous conservative judge, now retired, Michael Ludig, who I had argued in front of, and I'm a friend of his too. I try to keep friends across ideological lines. That's, that's what I believe in. And got, and got Judge Ludig to advise Vice President Pence there's no way that what you're being forced to do is constitutional. To his great courage and credit, Vice President Pence did that. Why do I bring it up now? Because that's a real fancy curiosity. Is the Vice President like a subordinate? Is it like, I'm the boss man, you're the vice, and I'm telling you to do this? Or is the Vice President kind of constitutionally independent, particularly when presiding over the, 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 the Senate, or in this case, the Senate and House of Representatives, and, and is not in the, you know, it's an official act, but it may not be a core official act. And that's going to be sorted out by the judge. So I want to be good to my host. I don't want to make sure we overrun our time. I can work forever. I'm, I'm you know, I'm being paid by, I'm not being paid by the hour, but um, I'll take a few more questions and I'll tell more, you my story. And then I'm happy for, to talk to you afterwards. Time for one more question. One more question. All right. Um. My question is, I've always thought of the Constitution as a living document, which in my mind has always implied that the court would have room right. for nuanced thinking. Right. Am I to understand from some of what you're saying that Congress's role in that interpretation of is where all of our... So let me, let me put it to you this way. I, like you, believe the Constitution is a living document. I, like you, believe the framers intended there would be evolution. I, I believe in the notion that sometimes they would enact a principle, but not understand the ramifications of that principle, but a subsequent generation would be able to see. I'm totally there. Justice Clarence Thomas is not. And some conservatives are not. And this has been a debate for 200 years. And I think what, what the right answer to your question is what you're hearing from me in this new epoch is a retreat from the living document. No question. This has been absolutely wonderful. Can I tell, some, tell, tell my story, yes. though? Yes, wait, wait. We Bonus coverage, all right? Bonus coverage. So you've had to listen to a constitutional law lecture for an hour. It's a Friday afternoon in one of the most beautiful states in the world. Maybe some of you are wondering, I could, after that, use a glass of wine. You know, I could. Maybe a martini, maybe some beverage. I'd like to like have a little fun after, a, after an hour of a, of a lecture on a Friday afternoon. And you may wonder, what does the Constitution tell us about? <laughs> so here's the answer. It's, yeah, it's a little bit of a story. Here's the answer. You know, George Washington, he was the unanimous president. Everybody revered him. He was a saintly figure. And he didn't like factions, and he didn't like conflict, and he didn't like arguments. He'd seen enough of that during the war. And so there really weren't political parties during the Washington year. But as it became clear that he was only going to serve two years, that that's the precedent he wanted to set, now that's part of our Constitution, he started the custom, parties were forming. And they don't have the names they have today. It's not the Democrats and Republicans. It was the Federalists. They believed in a strong central government. They believed in strong relations with England. They believed in a, in a strong mercantile economy. Um, they, they often were supportive of, of mercantile interests. People like Alexander Hamilton, famous Federalist. 
Then there were the Anti-Federalists. It took a, they had a hard time getting a, a name. Um, they, they ended up with a kind of clumsy name, the Jeffersonian Republicans, but not the Republican Party that Lincoln would be part of and, and now, but that was their, their working name. The, those folks um, believed in a more agrarian economy, a weak central government, weren't fond of mercantile interests like the central bank, and sided with France in foreign policy, not with England. So these, these two parties are forming, and the jealousies are forming, and so on. The first victors were the Federalists. John Adams from New England, Federalist president, had, had a Federalist Congress for a while, um, but it was not a popular presidency. And he lost. He lost it to the other side, to Thomas Jefferson. Then and now, there's a lame duck period. So this is when the period between, between when the election occurs and the actual power transition takes place. Now we've, we've shortened it. Elections in the first week of November, third week in, in January, we bring in the new president. But back in those days, it was a longer period. It lasted till March. So if you're thinking about it, you're a Federalist, you're, you're hurting. You lost the White House. White House wasn't completely built yet, but you, lo you, lost, you lost the presidency. You lost both houses of Congress. What are you going to do? So the Federalists think, I know what we'll do. We'll create a zillion federal judgeships. We'll just, we'll just make all these new federal judges. And guess what we'll do? We'll put stout federalists into those federal judgeships. So at least we'll hang on to one branch of government. And you may remember the story of the midnight judges. They were, they were creating these positions and sending these positions out and so on. Well, the most important federalist as part of this court stacking plan was a Virginian named John Marshall. I told you all about John Marshall. He was the Secretary of State for John Adams. So you had two Federalists, one from the South, one from the North. And, and John Adams said, I've got to have a powerful Federalist voice on the Supreme Court. Will you be Chief Justice? John Marshall wasn't sure. He didn't know if it was a good job. He, you know, he kind of wanted to go back to Virginia. But he said yes. And of course, the rest is history. It became enormously important. Well, the Republicans then had a real role politically. Jefferson was elected, Monroe was elected, Madison was elected. And so they say, what well, goes around comes around. We got to get some good Republicans on that US Supreme Court <coughs> to counteract John Marshall. And everybody they appointed became seduced by the power of John Marshall. He was such a charismatic figure. He was such a warm guy. He was such a brilliant lawyer. He loved to party, he loved to drink, he loved to gamble. These justices would have these extravagant dinner parties, and they came under his spell. And Thomas Jefferson would complain, no matter who I put on that Supreme Court, John Marshall takes him over. And James Madison would complain. Finally, they thought they had their duty. They had a brilliant jurist from New England named Joseph Story. And he was a stout Republican, and he was a scholar. He was maybe the most learned scholar in the United States. He wrote the first American treatise on constitutional law. It still gets cited, story on constitutional law. And Madison said to himself, I'm going to put Joseph Story on there, and John Marshall's not going to be able to counteract. He has enough intellect and spine. So with all this fanfare, Joseph Story gets put on the US Supreme Court. Now. Believe it or not, back in those days, there was occasionally scandal in Washington. Oh, hard to believe. And a scandal began to circulate about the Supreme Court. Back in those days, watching Supreme Court arguments was one of Washington's favorite sports. I wish we would put Supreme Court arguments on television. You'd be fascinated. They're mesmerizing. I loved when I argued in the Supreme Court. It was, it's fascinating. Back then, it was one of the things that people did. And these arguments, unlike today, which are short, an hour or two hours, would go on for days. And all these famous orators like Daniel Webster would argue, and everybody would go watch. Well, here was the ugly rumor. The ugly rumor was the Supreme Court justices appear to be drinking during oral arguments. <laughs> and, and right after the arguments, they'd go vote. And sometimes it looked like they were walking into the conference room inebriated. And here we're supposed to have the Supreme Court deciding these famous cases, and these folks are drunk. This is not right. 
So John Marshall was stung by the rumor, by the gossip. So he passed a new edict as Chief Justice. The liquor cabinet of the U.S. Supreme Court will remain locked on argument days and when we are in conference, unless it's raining. <laughs> so the very first day that Joseph Story is coming on to the court, they hear the argument. It was a short argument that day. It's a beautiful late afternoon like this. They go into the Supreme Court conference room. And John Marshall looks at Joseph Story, the most junior justice now, and he said, Justice Story, you know my edict. As the most junior justice, I would like you to go to the window, open the shutters, and determine whether or not it's raining. So Joseph Story opens the window, and he's blinded by the beautiful sunlight of the late afternoon in Washington Mall. He comes back, he says, Mr. Chief Justice, I am here to report that the sun outside is brightly shining. And John Marshall looked at Joseph's story and he said, Justice Story, you came here with such a reputation for being so learned in the law, so learned in the Constitution. Surely you know that the Constitution clearly states that the jurisdiction of this court extends to all the states and territories of the United States. It must be raining somewhere. <laughs> Open the liquor cabinet. <laughs> be, before I leave, let me tell you about my, the book. Um, it's free. And all you have to do is write a donation to the Vermont Law and Graduate School. Whatever you would like to do. We're an enormously important resource to the state. We provide all kinds of legal services to folks. We do all sorts of things to aid the judiciary. Three of the five Vermont Supreme Court justices are graduate of that school. The other two are honorary graduates. Half of our Attorney General's office graduated from the school. We do a lot of good in this country and a lot of good in this for this school. And anything you're moved to donate to that school would be um, welcome. And feel free to take a book. And if they run out, let me know. Email me, and I'll make sure you can get a copy. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Me. Wonderful.